the air so high.
Ladies and gentlemen, please take your seats. The program will begin shortly. Good afternoon, everyone. Could people please take their seats? Just a, a second, just so I can say um, one more time to everyone, hello and welcome to the luncheon. Um, we have, this is our second year in having a luncheon to give for an honor of our awardees. And the actual award ceremony will start at 12.50, so you have, oh, about 20 minutes to eat lunch. I suppose that that's what both, most of us take anyway. Um, I would like to say that there are 1,300 people in this room. And these 1,300 people are coming to celebrate the accomplishments of our awardees. And I think that that's a wonderful thing to think about as we move through lunch and then our program will start at 12.50. Thank you all for being here. Okay, see you soon. <laughs>
cell phones. Again, President Barbara Schneider. We keep this train moving. Well, um, thank you again for attending this exciting celebration for education research and to honor those that have made important contributions to our field. It is important to take the time to recognize these dedicated scholars and the work they are accomplishing. We come not only to acknowledge the achievements of their career, but the promise it signifies for the future value and impact of education research. We'd like to thank the supporters of this event, bronze level, including several research organizations, 30 university sponsors, AERA divisions, and SIGs. Our silver sponsors include the Foundation for Child Development, the University of Southern California Rossier School of Education, Peabody College, Vanderbilt University, and the William T. Grant Foundation. And I'd like to give a very special thanks to my university as the major sponsor for this event, Michigan State University College of Education. And I want you to know we do not have a presidential session uh, reception anymore. This is really kind of what has replaced that. And Michigan State has graciously going to invite you all to our party tonight at the Convention Center, 830, 400, Terrace Level 2. So we hope to see you there. By that time, maybe the games will be over. Also, I'd like to thank the outgoing editors, Kenneth Howey from the American Educational Research Association Journal on the Social and Institutional Analysis section, and Arlette Willis and Violet Harris for the, they're the outgoing for teaching, learning, and human development. So um, now it gives me great pleasure to introduce Mark Behrens from Notre Dame University, who will be our Masters of Ceremonies. Um, he, as you know, is the program chair. And just a tiny little bit about Mark, I'll say a little bit more later. He's been an exceptional college colleague, and this meeting is indeed a tribute to his effort and initiative. Take it away, Mark. <laughs> Thank you, Barbara. Um, Barbara and I, if you're going to be around today, um, here or at the pres presidential address, you'll have this love fest between Barbara and me. But it's been an absolute pleasure to work with her. And, and thanks to her and all of her support. Thanks to, to Felice and her staff, who've been incredible uh, over this last year. And just, this is a wonderful celebration. So welcome and, and congratulations to all the award winners. Before we get into the awards, uh, we want to just take a few moments of silence uh, to remember those in, in this association and have made contributions over the years. There's been some people that have passed away, and if we just take a, before we get into the awards, take a few moments of silence, you'll see their names as they flash on the screen. To present our first award 
for the Palmer O. Johnson Memorial Award. I want to invite to the stage uh, the presenter of that award, Spiros Konstantinopoulos. Thank you very much, Mark. Uh, I'm very pleased to introduce the recipient of the Palmer o. o. Johnson Memorial Award, uh, Liliana Garces, for her uh, article that was published in ARJ uh, in April of 2013. Uh, the title of her paper is Understanding the Impact of Affirmative Action Bans in Different Graduate Fields of Study. Uh, it is a very important and timely topic, and uh, the committee members thought overall that the paper was exemplary in its blend of substance, methodology, and policy relevance. Uh, well done, Liliana. Sorry? Yeah. Buenas tardes. My heartfelt thanks to AERA and the members of the selection committee for their work. It's an honor to receive this award. I must admit, I looked at the list of past recipients, and I was left with a deep sense of humility to be in their company. Thanks to my partner, John, for his support, my colleagues at Penn State University, my former colleagues at George Washington University and all of you who took the time to be here with us today to celebrate. I'm especially grateful to the members of my dissertation committee at Harvard Graduate School of Education, Bridget Terry Long, John Willett, and Richard Mornane, who provided substantial feedback to early versions of this article. Um, my thanks as well to the Spencer Foundation for supporting the research and the Council of Graduate Studies for the data. I'm also grateful to Gary Orfield, who was my first advisor at Harvard and inspires me to continue to ask questions and engage in work that will advance greater equity and racial justice. Uh, re receiving this award for this article is especially meaningful because of the topic that it covers, racial diversity in graduate studies. This is an area that affects all of us as educators and researchers. It's the place where we're training future faculty, policymakers, and leaders of our country. And because this is such a critical area of training, policies or practices that influence who gets to be part of that community are ultimately decisions about what questions get asked, what perspectives inform the answers to those questions, and whose perspectives and interests we take into account when creating laws that govern all of us. Ensuring individuals who reflect the range of experiences in our racially and ethnically diverse society as full members of our graduate community is a critical step toward racial equity and justice. And I'm grateful every day, uh, especially today, to um, have my work be one that involves engaging with these questions. I am very honored by this recognition. Muchísimas gracias. So for our second award, I want to uh, invite Mary Kennedy as the presenter of the Review of Research Award. Thank you. I uh, chaired the committee that reviews, um, reviews and uh, this is the main journal we look at, but we also look at the volume each year that comes out, a hard book, 
called Review of Research and Education. <clears throat> One of the things that's especially impressive in doing this review is the quality of work that we're reading. I was just astounded at how many really high quality articles we saw. And so I'm especially happy to be able to introduce the winners of this year's award, Michael Lawson and his father, Hal Lawson, who wrote a piece called New Conceptual Frameworks for Student Engagement, Research, Policy, and Practice that was, uh, I think the committee uh, liked it because it's, it was very well done, it was very conceptually coherent, and it applies to teachers at college level, kindergarten level, and researchers, and it just has a very broad and uh, useful and well done article. Thank you. So I'd like to start off and say a few words about uh, my co-author, uh, Hal Lawson, who <laughs> is, uh, is not only an, an artful and prolific scholar, but the best thing about him is that he's even a better dad and a better granddad and a better family member. So it's an honor for me to share this award with him as well as the rest of our family members who have been so supportive of us uh, through the writing of this paper and through the years. Um, we'd also like to be able to thank uh, Professor Kennedy and the rest of the members of the review committee for this tremendous honor. Um, you know, the quality of any review is conditional in large part on the quality of works that preceded it. And so we are very grateful to the entire engagement research community for providing such sturdy shoulders to stand on. And in particular, we'd like to be able to acknowledge the intellectual and scholarly leadership provided by the editors of the International Handbook on Student Engagement, uh, Sandra Christensen, Amy Reichley, and Kathy Wiley, as well as William Tate for his edited book on schools, neighborhoods, and communities. Uh, both of his works were highly instrumental in helping to inform and advance our thinking about engagement and social ecology. I know that my dad wants to thank his colleagues at the School of Education at the University at Albany as well as John Goodlad for their uh, support and influence and I would like to thank mine at Binghamton but I would also like to thank my doctoral advisors in the School of Education at the University of California at Davis who are seated over here, especially my um, advisor Paul Heckman, Catherine Mason and McCall Kurlander for their support. And lastly, we would like to thank RER co-editor uh, Frank Worrell and the anonymous reviewers uh, for RER for seeing us through multiple revisions and for not only providing reviews that were, of course, uh, first-rate substantively, but as importantly, were always delivered in a tone that was highly conversational. And their efforts and their spirit are indicative of why my father and I are so proud and honored to be a part of such an outstanding and vibrant community of scholars. Thank you so much for this award. Well done. I, I love my kids a lot and I'm really proud of them, but I think the last thing they would ever want to do is publish with me, so well, well done. Uh, for our next award, the Early Career Award, uh, uh, no, actually, the next award is for Relating Research to Practice Award, Interpretive Scholarship. Um, I want to invite Beth Gamsey to the, to the stage to present that award. Good afternoon. The Interpretive Scholarship category recognizes the importance of not only understanding research, but being able to translate that and interpret that research into language that is understandable to a much broader audience. And on behalf of the committee uh, this year, there was no question about which recipient deserved this award. Sean Harper, for his many contributions, both scholarly and interpretive, I'd like to invite you to come up and accept this award.
Welcome to Philadelphia. I would first like to thank anyone who has downloaded, read, reviewed, critiqued, assigned, cited, engaged in a discussion about, tweeted, retweeted, or published anything I've ever written. <laughs> Likewise, I thank the now thousands of high school and college students who have completed surveys and generously participated in face-to-face -face qualitative interviews for my research. I also thank AERA for recognizing me in this way, but more importantly, for annually honoring research that connects with policy and practice. I often tell my students and myself that the research is no good if it is only published in places to which the masses have no access or written in ways that fail to speak directly to practitioners and policymakers. I am quite fortunate to teach and do my work at a place that embraces these values. I therefore thank my colleagues at the University of Pennsylvania, especially Andy Porter, Laura Perna, Matt Hartley, Mary Beth Gassman, and of course the one and only Vivian Gaston. Seven years ago I met David Johns who at the time was the Senior Education Policy Advisor to Ted Kennedy and the Senate Help Committee. He is now Executive Director of the White House Initiative on Educational Excellence for African Americans. Following my keynote address last night for Division G, someone asked how I managed to get my research in the hands of policymakers. It was David Johns that made that happen for me. David keeps me working in Washington and has done a masterful job of teaching me how to interpret my scholarship for his colleagues on Capitol Hill and elsewhere. I am indeed indebted to him. I'd be remiss if I didn't take just a second here to acknowledge and uh, thank my very handsome husband, husband, Sean, who fully supports me in connecting my research to practice. Last but certainly not least, I will be forever grateful to my dear colleague friends, Arnitha Ball and James Minor, for nominating me for this award. I am deeply honored. Thank you. Congratulations, Sean. I have this very uh, specific script to follow, and so I have to be very careful because I almost skipped over that award. That would be a really wonderful thing to kind of randomly go through this. I'm sure ARA would be very happy with me. Um, our next award is the Early Career Award. And I want to invite Anne Marie Palanzar to present that. Thank you, and good afternoon. I'm so pleased on behalf of the AERA Early Career Award Committee to uh, present our recipients today. There were 23 nominations this year. And to help with the daunting task of selecting from a number of deserving candidates, the committee agreed that in, additional, in addition to traditional indicators of accomplishment, we will also consider the significance of the problem space in which the nominee is working, evidence of impact beyond publications, evidence that the scholar is attempting to cross boundaries, and evidence of contributions to both theory and method. It's a tall order, but trust me, we needed these additional criteria. And even guided by those criteria, the committee was challenged and ultimately asked the governance of AERA if we could please present two awards. And we were delighted when we received their support for this. It's my distinct honor to first present to you Dr. Sarah Coldrick Robb. Dr. Robb engages in large scale <laughs> multiple method studies to tackle challenging questions related to improving equity and access to college. Her work illuminates the role of unrecognized mechanisms such as the reverse transfer that affect college enrollment and completion for low-income students. Her research in community colleges and need-based financial aid has also produced novel insights to the field. In addition to publishing her work in top venues in the field, Dr. Goldrick Robb is known for the significant influence of her research on educational policy and public dialogues at the state and national levels. Congratulations, Dr. Robb.
Good afternoon. Quite honestly, I'm totally overwhelmed. <laughs> when I found out about this award, I burst into tears, and it's all I can do not to do it again. This is a huge, it's incredible honor. But the first people that I have to thank, unfortunately, could not be here with me today. And they're my daughter, Annie, and my son, Connor. My four-year-old and seven-year-old are watching me at home, so the first thing I have to say is hi. <laughs> and to their dad, Liam, who's been my partner for 10 years now, there are no words for what he puts up with and how hard he works. Two children on the tenure track, umpteen projects. I travel every week. He does all of it. I'm here today because of two people. My grandmother, who I lost last year, and my grandfather, Isaac and Geraldine Yucha, are why I do what I do, why I fight, why I speak for those who I feel don't have sufficient voice. My grandfather has taught me to stand up to anyone and anything that thinks it will get in my way. I can't actually say in polite company the way he puts that. My grandmother taught me to say it in English, to say it clearly, to say it simply, and to say it once. So I'm trying to be brief, Grandma. I have a lot of people who've helped me. I, I, don't, I don't know how to even begin to thank them. Becca and Adam and David nominated me for this, and that was tremendous and overwhelming to have actually received it. UW and my department at Educational Policy Studies and Sociology have been wonderful homes for me and have allowed me to do just about anything. My family, my friends, there are Three women who hold me up every time that I think it's too hard or I've had enough. Nancy Kendall is here with me today. That's my best friend and collaborator now. Patrice Coffin takes care of my children. You don't get to do anything well in this life if you don't feel your children are safe when you're at work. And Patrice has done that for me for years now. And Allison Bowman is my right hand. Sometimes she's my left hand and my right hand. Anything I think up or ever want to get done, Allison makes it happen. And together we're opening the Wisconsin Hope Lab on May 5th with an incredible team of graduate students and staff. And none of it, none of it would have been done without her. So I'm going to stop there and simply tell you all that thank you, thank you, thank you for this vote of confidence, and just thank you. I appreciate it. I'm also delighted to introduce you to Dr. Mary Helen Imardino Young. Her scholarship is at the forefront of the new subdiscipline of mind, brain, and education. She's been widely recognized for the innovativeness and the high quality of her work. For example, just to give you a sense of what she's up to, in her most recent research, Dr. Imordino Young is conducting a longitudinal cross-cultural investigation of psychosocial and neurobiological aspects of emotion development in adolescence. This research is among the first of its kind to investigate cultural and community-related effects on the neural systems that support empathy and social emotion. Finally, she's one of the leading figures, even as an early career scholar, in her, of her generation in explicating the implications of studies of the mind and brain for education. Please join me in congratulating Dr. Imardino Young. Thank you. I must admit, I was very surprised when I learned that I had won this award, and not just because I hadn't known that I was nominated. 
and not, this is not a, a, a statement on the quality of my scholarship. But once I got over my initial shock, and to be honest, once I found out that I had co-won the award, that I had shared the award with Sarah, I was very deeply grateful and also very excited about what this means, I think, the statement that this makes for the future of the field of education research. I was brought back to a comment that was made by Catherine Snow in my first doctoral pro seminar at Harvard Graduate School of Education. And she told us that education is not a discipline, it's a field. And of course, we were all thoroughly insulted. But now I came back and began to appreciate the meaning of that remark. I had not thought that work like mine, work that strives to understand the nature of human biology and how we come to have a self, what culture does, how we affiliate with one another, and how we learn in a really deep sense, how we build an acculturated self. Work like that could be recognized by an organization like the ARA because it's not traditionally considered education research. But if I think back on Catherine's comment, I realize that education is a field and not a discipline because if you think about it, education is defined by a set of very, very messy problems and not by a history of tools to solve them. And in order to really address these problems, which are dynamic and changing and fluid with the society itself, we need to be able to pull evidence from wherever we can find it, any evidence that's relevant to the way humans interact and learn. And so I'm just very, very grateful and humbled to allow my work to be put forth as a kind of uh, uh, model or reference for that kind of interdisciplinary thinking in education. And I'm especially proud to share this award with someone who does such exceptional policy-related, more traditional education research. I think it makes a very lovely statement for the future of the field. Of course, I would like to thank all of the many wonderful and generous and wise mentors who supported me in taking this very unorthodox path, among them Howard Gardner, Kurt Fisher, and Catherine Snow, and David Rose at the Harvard Graduate School of Education, Robert Retta, and especially Antonio and Hannah DiMazio at the University of Southern California. Thank you. Next, Judy Singer will present the E.F. Lindquist Award. Good afternoon. The E.F. Lindquist Award honors a distinguished scholar and researcher in recognition of research in the field of testing and measurement. The award is co-sponsored between AERA and ACT. And I'm pleased to announce on behalf of the committee that this year's recipient is Mark Rekase of Michigan State University. In discussing who to award this uh, honor to, the committee discussed Mark's lifetime of contributions, both in the academia and in testing organizations, and his contributions to educational membership. Me measurement, Ooh, educational measurement, sorry. Um, his areas of inquiry include a wide range of issues from going back into the 1970s to something that was very novel, computerized adaptive testing, uh, to his pioneering work in multidimensional item response theory in the 1980s, to more recent work on teacher accountability and on value added models. Mark's theoretical and practical work has touched significant numbers of people in the world of educational research and educational measurement. And I think I would also add that as an academic, he has touched thousands of graduate students through his research and his teaching. So I'd like to present the award to Mark Rikes. Well, I, I, I wrote myself some notes so I wouldn't talk too long. Uh, this is a, a really great honor to receive this award. I look at the list of previous persons who have uh, obtained this award, and it's unbelievable. They're my heroes, and I don't really 
you know, yet understand what it's like to have my name on the same list as, uh, as they're there. Uh, it's actually especially important for me because uh, many years ago, 16 years ago, I worked at ACT, and, uh, and every day when I was going into work, I would pass a bronze plaque, which was the bust of uh, V.F. Lindquist. I never actually met the man, but he was there in the hallway, and, and, uh, and it sort of had a little patina on it. It's like people would rub his belly of a Buddha. But uh, that, uh, and it, so his, uh, it was in the, the building named after him, the, the Lindquist building, and I particularly uh, enjoyed my time when I was at ACT. There was a wonderful environment that stimulated uh, research and good thinking. So I really do appreciate the, the time that I had there before I came to Michigan State. Uh, I have to give a lot of credit to the environment that I was working in to the person who was my supervisor when I was at ACT. This was Cindy Schmeiser. And uh, she did a lot to support the kind of research efforts that we developed. And we actually developed quite a large research team. So I can't really say that this award is mine. It really belongs to a whole group of people. There were many great colleagues at ACT that worked with me there and stimulated a lot of good thoughts. The same is true of Michigan State now and the time that I've been. And there's other people around the world that have had a lot to do with the ideas that I've had that I've gained from them and maybe just put them into practice after being stimulated by them. So it's truly gratifying to get this kind of an award, which uh, reinforces certain kinds of work that sometimes has a pretty small audience. And so I look at this room, it's a huge audience, and uh, it makes you feel really good about those kinds of things that you've done. So thank you very much. I greatly appreciate this award. Next, we move on to the Outstanding Book Award, and Ron Astor will present that award. Hello. I'd like to first thank uh, AARA for giving us the equivalent of the committee of another honorary doctorate with the number of beautiful books that we had to read this year. There were many. So I would like to thank the committee members, Paul Atwell, James Banks, Jeffrey Hennig, Susan Moore Johnson, Karen Triello, and Charles Payne. Uh, this is, was a wonderful committee to work with. Uh, there were many, many outstanding books, but there was great consensus at the end in, ter in terms of what kind of book we wanted. And I'd like to read to you some words uh, from Susan Moore Johnson and Jeffrey Hennig that captured, I think, the committee's spirit. David Kerbs, Improbable Scholars, the rebirth of a great American school system and strategy for American school represents the best that qualitative research and education can provide. He conducted a systematic study of teachers and administrators at work in Union City, New Jersey. Improbable Scholars draws out the intricate linkages among the national, state, local, and even school-specific politics and policies, linkages that are often missed by researchers who focus exclusively on one level or the other. By wrapping this informed perspective in a compelling narrative about how real people operate within institutional and organizational constraints, Dr. Kerp provides policy and practical lessons for those who care about improving urban public schools. And I'd like to add that the committee felt especially strong that this book was accessible. It had scholarly heft. It was beautiful in terms of how it was written. And we believe that your students, that policymakers, teachers, and scholars could learn much from this book. And it's my honor to present this award to David Kerp. Well, I'll join in the thanks. I think I'll steal Sean's thank you lines. Um, they work just fine for me. Um, for a professor, receiving that Standing Book Award is a little bit like winning the Oscar. Although I don't think anybody's going to confuse Ron for Ellen DeGeneres or me for Matthew McConaughey. So here comes the, I couldn't have done it without you part of the Oscar speech. Um, 
I, thanks to my mentors, I was, I guess I still am a lawyer, um, when at the ripe old age of 24, I came under the spell of Sandy Jenks and Mike Smith and most of all David Cohn, um, and they remain mentors to me. But in a lot of respects, my mentors are more broadly the people in this room because this is a book that leans heavily on path-breaking scholarship from a host of disciplines. Now, lawyers are never insulted. Well, maybe they are insulted when they're told that they have a field and not a discipline. Um, we're magpies. We steal from every place. Um, and the kind of research that I was able to rely on gave me the high-powered high lenses that I needed to make sense of what I was seeing in a truly remarkable school district, Union City, New Jersey. It's a poor immigrant Latino district, a district that was 25 years ago so bad that the state was about to take it over. Here's the reason why you should pay attention to Union City, most crowded city in the country, 95th uh, poorest city in the country, 30% undocumented citizens, uh, residents in the city. 90, 93% of uh, students graduate from high school. 75% of the students go on to enroll in college. And so I wanted to figure out why. I had a puzzle to unravel. And I, want, I felt that to do that, I was going to be, a, in a sense, a bad scholar. I was going to cut across a number of fields. I was going to look at the crucible of the classroom, the interplay among teachers, the leadership skills of the principals, and the superintendent's success in building a coherent system enmeshed in a rich political and cultural context. And then, because I do, after all, teach public policy, I wanted to see whether I had a one-off story or whether the strategy, the old school strategies used in Union City uh, worked in other places that were defying the demographic odds. And indeed, that's exactly what I what I found. I've got to say, the award came as a shocker to me. I had no idea that I'd been nominated. Um, and it's very different from the distinguished books that in the past have received this recognition. So my model is The Simpsons, a show that most of you have probably seen during the quarter century that it's been on the air. Now, how so? So a 10-year-old watching The Simpsons gets something out of the story a 20-year-old gets something different, and a 40-year-old something different yet again. And that's true, I, th I think, of improbable scholars as well. People say, it's a great read. You know, I have this fantasy that this is all New Yorker stuff, but with some scholarship surrounding it. Um, other people will see that there is that scholarship, that general frame, and take it as given and move on. And then still other people are going to dive deep into the 40 pages of endnotes to see if this David Kirk knows what he's talking about. Um, for one of a better term, Improbable Scholars is a book of public scholarship. It's aimed not only at academics, but at a wider audience. I think of the book as a ticket of admission to a wider national conversation. So politicians and parents, and especially the dedicated teachers and administrators, all too often the target of cheap shots, these are the unsung heroes of education. They work small miracles every day. I hadn't spent a lot of time in classrooms before my year in Union City, and what I saw opened my eyes to what's happening on the ground, to the crucial particulars that researchers, however distinguished their scholarship, never set foot in the schools, are never going to appreciate. So here is my plea. Whether you work in big data sets, or develop high theory, or craft tests, you need to spend time in the classrooms and corridors of public schools. You'll see a richer reality, a reality that will complicate, and I dare say improve the work that all of us do. Thank you very much. Although we know this is not the Academy's Awards, um, pizza's on the way. And from here on out, instead of taking pictures, they're going to start taking selfies of themselves with the presenter. So. Um, next, we have a couple of awards that come out of the Scholars of Color in Education, both the Early Career Contribution Award and the Distinguished uh, Scholar Award. And I, I, uh, Kim, Kimberly Gomez will make that presentation. The Committee on Scholars of Color in Education Awards 
are recognized scholars in various stages in their careers who have contributed significantly to the understanding of issues that disproportionately affect minority populations and minority scholars who have made significant contribution to education, research, and development. It is my pleasure to introduce the two recipients for the Early Career Contribution Award. I will first introduce Professor Carter Andrews, Professor Dorinda Carter Andrews, um, whose research uses qualitative and quantitative methodologies and race-based theories to understand African-American adolescents' school experiences in um, and novice teachers' preparation for and perceptions of teaching in urban settings. Her work highlights the ways that race plays out in micro-level school interactions and demonstrates the complexity of how students adapt to often challenging school settings. Her research also focuses on critical race praxis with K-12 educators, with an emphasis on how to meet the academic needs of culturally diverse learners and how to build culturally inclusive learning environments where staff and students are focused on being more culturally responsive. Dorinda is an associate professor in the Department of Teacher Education at Michigan State University, and she's also a core faculty member of the African American and African Studies program. She received her EDD in Learning and Teaching from Harvard Graduate School of Education. She is the editor and contributing author of Contesting the Myth of a Post-Racial Era, the Continued Significance of Race in the United States Education, published in 2013. Please join me in congratulating Dr. Dorinda Carter Andrews. Good afternoon, thank you so much for this honor. It is truly humbling to be standing before you and being rece be receiving this honor uh, from AERA and particularly the Committee for the Scholars of Color in Education. I want to thank um, John Diamond for nominating me for this award, and also those who wrote letters of support, Dr. Patricia Edwards, Frank Tewitt, and Rich Milner. Um, it means so much to me that they thought enough of my work that it would be valuable to stand in the ranks of those who have received this award before me. I'm also so honored to be a co-recipient with Dr. Eve Tuck and to have been able to share together at, at the table today about our experiences along the journey. I like to think of my journey as one where I have really been able to do the kind of work that I wanted to do because of my community of caretakers. And there are so many other than John and Frank and Pat and Rich who have been uh, and still continue to be members of that community. I want to begin by thanking my former dean, Carol Ames, at Michigan State University. I was thinking about something Sarah said earlier, and I am also a mother and a wife, and I had three children pre-tenure. Uh, they are now ages four, five, and six. And if it were not for the support of my college, my department, and my dean at the time, it would not have been possible. I want to thank also my current dean, Don Heller, who continues to be an advocate for the kind of work that I do and for the type of identity that I've cultivated for myself as a scholar practitioner. Uh, it's, it means so much that not only AERA, but the institution in which I work values that kind of blended identity in an academic. I would be remiss if I did not thank my immediate family, my husband, who has done so much along the way to support my work and pick up uh, family duties with our three daughters. And he is not an academic. And so I really appreciate and love you for your support along the way. I also want to thank my doctoral advisor. When I went uh, to Harvard to get my doctorate, 
I just wanted to open a charter school. I thought I needed the credentials. I really never envisioned myself being a professor. And it was Kay Merseth, my doctoral advisor, who said, you have more to add to teacher education and the field of education more broadly uh, than just going back into K-12 and opening a charter school. So I thank her for pushing me, along with Micah Pollock and Pedro Nogueira, who were also members of my dissertation committee. I stand on the shoulders of giants. And I'm deeply honored to join the ranks of other scholars of color, many who are in the room, who have been able to do the kind of work for black and brown youth that I aim to continue doing in my career. There's a phrase that says, we make the road by walking. And I have really tried to walk the walk as an academic and not just talk the talk. I'm a product of parents of the Jim Crow South, they have both transitioned from this earth, and I would not be where I am today if it were not for my mother and father, John and Dorothea Carter, who, as people who went to school in segregated communities and segregated schools, told their children, you can do more and you can make an impact, not only for African American communities, but other communities in need. My mother was a community college educator and really was my first teacher. She spent 40 years in community college settings, and I thank her. I thank her for instilling in me a love for education and a love for underserved and marginalized youth. Lastly, I would be remiss if I did not say I'm so appreciative of the graduate students, the undergraduate students, and the K-12 teachers and administrators that I work with every day. They remind me why this work is important. They remind me why we cannot be afraid to talk about race and racism in school settings and to do something about it. And they remind me that there is a place and a need to bridge theory and practice. I thank God for his grace and his mercy. I would not be able to do any of this. And for anyone who has read, as Sean said, my work, who has used it in a class, who has tweeted it or retweeted it, I thank you and I look forward to continuing this journey. Thank you again. Next, I'd like to introduce Professor Eve Tuck. Professor Eve Tuck employs decolonizing research methodologies and theories of change to explore ethical and educational issues in the schooling lives of youth. Her work is considerate of the dynamic ways in which learning, growth, and development can occur and can also be stifled. Dr. Tuck has demonstrated a strong ability to conceptualize, manifest, and publish significant work in the areas of participatory research, educational and research philosophy, and indigenous studies. She is the author of Urban Youth and School Pushout, Gateways, Getaways, and the GED, which has been awarded the 2013 Outstanding Book of the Year Award from the Qualitative Research SIG of the AERA. She has also co-edited with Kay Wayne Yang, Youth Resistance Research and Theories of Change, published by Routledge 2014. Eve is Assistant Professor of Educational Foundations and Coordinator of Native American Studies at the State University of New York at New Paltz. Eve earned her PhD in Urban Education in 2008 at the Graduate Center, City University of New York. Please join me in congratulating Eve Tuck. Um, I would like to uh, begin by recognizing that our conference is taking place on Lenape Lenape land. Um, as an indigenous scholar, it makes sense. Um, it's appropriate for me to recognize that we're on the land of indigenous peoples. 
I also want to recognize St. Paul Island, which is um, where my people are, um, and to uh, name the fact that um, the experiences of people on St. Paul Island with researchers uh, would actually, uh, well, part of it maybe is more clear when I say that I'm the first person from my community to have earned a PhD. And I think in part that is because of the history of research on my home community. Um, that has been a problematic and troubled history. Uh, I would like to thank the Committee of Scholars of Color and Education for recognizing me in this way. When I first learned that I was a co-recipient with Dorinda Carter Andrews, I was so excited because we have so many friends in common but haven't met each other yet, so I at least thought that I would get to meet her here. Um, and I kept thinking of the word to uh, describe the feelings that I had, and they were so inadequate. I kept thinking of the word nice. Like, that's so, it's just so nice. <laughs> so if you think of asterisks beside the word nice, you know how I feel to have been recognized in this way. I'd like to um, thank my teachers at the CUNY Graduate Center in the Urban Education Program, and specifically, uh, thank my mentor, Michelle Fine, who taught me not only how to do uh, participatory action research, but taught me how to be in the world as a scholar, taught me how to feel OK um, and go to sleep at night and work up, wake up and do the work again tomorrow. I also want to thank and remember my teacher, Jean Anion, who we lost in September, or in September and um, as I said last night at a tribute for her who taught me to be brave as a writer. Um, I want to thank my colleagues at the State University of New York at New Paltz. New, uh, that is a wonderful place to work and write and think and I know that that is because of the warm and supportive community that I have there. I also um, am so grateful for my colleagues here at AERA, including uh, members of the Indigenous Peoples of the Americas SIG, the Indigenous Peoples of the Pacific SIG, and members of the SIG Executive Committee. I'm so grateful to my collaborators who in have included youth um, co-researchers, uh, community organizing, uh, community organizers who have worked with me as co-researchers, and also um, collaborators, many uh, scholars who are members of AERA who have written with me, especially uh, um, my colleague Lee Patel who wrote a letter in support of my nomination, and Kay Wayne Yang who wrote my nomination itself. Finally, I'd like to uh, express my appreciation to my family, including my partner Kevin, and my brothers Justin and John, my sister Melody. Um, I have a two-year-old named Kieran who uh, makes me make sense of the world. Um, yesterday morning, when he woke up at 5.30, and I said, welcome to the party, he said, Mom, this is not a party, it is Philadelphia. <laughs> Um, and um, I also want to uh, um, say that my baby is in the room. She's seven weeks old. Her name is Beverly. And my mom is here, too. So um, it's such a pleasure to get to have my mom in the audience. My very first presentation at AERA, I think two people showed up and my mom was one of them. And so it's fun to have my mom in the audience that is uh, exponentially larger than two. So thank you. Finally, the uh, Committee of Scholars of uh, Color and Education um, would like to introduce the awardee for the Distinguished Career Contribution Award, Professor Janelle Scott. Professor Janelle Scott's research explores the relationship between education, policy, and equality of opportunity through three policy strands. One, the racial politics of public edu education. 
two, the politics of school choice, marketization, and privatization, and three, the role of elite and community-based advocacy in shaping public education. Her current research explores the relationship between philanthropy and school choice policy in urban areas. With funding from the W.T. Grant Foundation, she is leading a research study that examines the role of intermediary organizations in research production, promotion, and utilization in the case of incentivist educational reforms. Janelle has a joint appointment as an assistant professor in the Graduate School of Education's Haas Diversity Research Center and in the African American Studies Department. She is the editor of the 2005 School Choice and Diversity, What the Evidence Says, published by Teacher College Press. She was a Spencer Foundation Dissertation Year Fellow and a National Academy of Education Spencer Foundation Postdoctoral Fellow. Professor Scott received a PhD from UCLA's Graduate School of Education and Information Studies in Educational Policy. Please join me in welcoming Professor Janelle Scott. So, wow, there are quite a few people here. So I'd like to extend my warm appreciation to Professor Gomez and the AERA Committee on Scholars of Color for selecting me for this honor uh, in what was no doubt a very competitive and deserving pool of nominees. Um, I was also shocked to find out I received this award. Um, I didn't know I was nominated. So, so I had to you know, wrap my brain around this distinguished scholar career award. I was standing in the line at the grocery store reading my email on my phone when I got the wonderful news from AERA that I had received this award. The people in line around me can assure you that the expletives I uttered <laughs> were neither distinguished <laughs> nor scholarly, <laughs> but they were full of surprise and appreciation. So thank you. My work has explored the racial politics of education through the study of the socio-political dynamics of school choice, privatization, and the marketization of urban education. But under undergirding that work is a deep interest in the relationship between public education, opportunity structures, and American democracy. My understanding of the political history of American education tells me that any progress toward racial and social justice in schooling has always occurred as a result of social movements that started within the communities harmed by inequality. And much of my work has tried to excavate the past and have it converse with the present, where the democratic spaces fought for by so many activists are being constrained and eradicated in urban districts around the country, often in the name of civil rights and empowerment. My work has been enhanced by the insights and support of so many people and organizations Thank you very much to the Spencer Foundation Dissertation Fellowship Program, the National Academy of Education, Spencer Foundation Postdoctoral Fellowship, the Ford Foundation, and the William T. Grant Foundation, who have all provided critical support in, the, in order to study these issues. Um, the funding environment for work on politics of education is, is a very small pool, and I appreciate that support so much. I've been informed by and inspired by so many scholars in the course of my career. And there are far more that I will have to thank privately than I can have time to name here. But I would be remiss if I didn't mention James Anderson, Chris Gutierrez, Kevin Wellner, Gary Orfield, Vanessa Siddlewalker, Linda Darling Hammond, Angela Valenzuela, Gloria Ladson Billings, Prudence Carter, William Trent, William Watkins, Rosalind Mickelson, and the late Jane Anion. I also thank my longtime research collaborators and friends, Christopher Lubiansky and Elizabeth DeBray, who have helped to push my thinking and research in unexpected and really fun ways. That's Liz laughing over there. I've also benefited greatly from having had access to high quality and affordable undergraduate and doctoral education, first at UC Berkeley and then at UCLA. I'm so grateful to the committed and brilliant faculty and students 
from whom I learned so much at each institution. Within UCLA's urban schooling doctoral program, I found a vibrant intellectual home. It is a rare day that goes by that I do not mind an idea or an insight that I first encountered at UCLA. My amazing dissertation committee consisted of Jeannie Oakes, Amy Stewart Wells, Mike Rose, and Michael Stoll. It was a dream team, and I'm so grateful to them for their continued support and friendship. I also thank my former colleagues and students at New York University where I started my academic career. I especially want to acknowledge the critical mentorship Gary Anderson has provided me over the years. Uh, and I want to thank him for not only supporting me, but so many scholars probably in this room. I also thank my colleagues, students, and friends at UC Berkeley and the Graduate School of Education and African American Studies Department, who are some of the most dynamic and committed and creative people I've had the pleasure to work and play with. Thank you to my former dean, David Pearson, for hiring me, and my current dean, Judith Warren Little, for shepherding me through tenure and promotion a few years ago. I'm also deeply grateful for UC Berkeley's family leave policies and its campus-based early childhood education program. I owe so much to all the caregivers, the teachers, the babysitters, my fellow mama PhDs who have nurtured, fed, and loved my two children so I could work. Sorry. <laughs> That wasn't the part I thought I was going to get emotional about. So I want to extend my deep gratitude in particular to Nayela Nasir, Tina Trujillo, and Lisa Garcia, but Lisa Garcia Bedoya, who are wonderful scholars in their own right, and who I had the pleasure of joining UC Berkeley's faculty with in 2008. They've each watched my kids while I finished revising an article, writing a grant proposal, or even had a rare date with my husband. I want to thank my parents, who instilled in me their faith in the power of education, their love of learning, their belief in our intellect, and their concern for racial justice. My amazing mother would have no, about, no doubt been a scholar and, or an artist herself were she not helping to raise eight children. And is it, to, it is to her that I owe my love of literature, writing, and the arts. And my seven siblings are always inspirations to me, no matter how dispersed we are. So this is the part I thought I was going to get emotional about. Here we go. I want to extend my deep appreciation to my husband, Matthew Perry, the smartest and kindest man I know. Thank you for being here today to share this with me and supporting me through dissertation writing, a move across the country, and the gauntlet of tenure and promotion. And finally, to my children, Julie and Miles, thank you for being the amazing spirits you are, for reminding me to laugh, not to take this all so seriously, and for being such terrible sleepers that when I travel, I am unaffected by jet lag. My work takes me away from you far more often than I would like, but I carry you two and your dad with me no matter where I go. And to Julia especially, thank you for missing your performance in The Wizard of Oz to be with your mama today. And I promise when this is over, we're gonna go get some ice cream. Thank you. For our next award, Estelle and Ben Simon will present the award for the social justice in education. Thank you, Mark. I'd like to start by thanking the members of the uh, selection committee for the social justice in education award. They are professors Django Paris, April Taylor, and Sean Harper, as well as George Wimberly of the ARA office. The Social Justice in Education Award honors and holds up to the ARA community individuals who have advanced social justice through education research. The 11th recipient of the Social Justice in Education Award is Professor Michael Olivas of the University of Houston Law Center. Professor Olivas is the William B. Bates Distinguished Chair in Law at the University of Houston. Michael's legal scholarship has been foundational to the dismantling of policies that prevented access to public education for undocumented children and youth. His scholarship also laid the groundwork for the Texas Top 10% Plan that made it possible to provide greater access to Texas flagship universities to any student who graduated within the top 10% of their high school class. Please join me in welcoming and congratulating Professor Michael Olivas.
First, I'd like to thank all of the people who prepared our food today and served us, and I ask you to join me in acknowledging their work. Uh, this is such an extraordinary opportunity that I can't help but think of my late father, Savino Olivas, who um, was, was very hard on his children. I'm the oldest of 10, and each of us was in turn expected to watch out for the others. I, I can't believe they had nine others after me. Uh, I would have been such a great kid if I hadn't had to watch out over these little bastards over the years. <laughs> Of course, all of them think that they were improving the breed uh, as, as we moved along. My father was a, a liquor store clerk and after seven children decided to go to college and become an accountant where he specialized in, in uh, working with Indian tribes and, and with other, other clients. He was the kind of person who held us to great um, standards, and he was also the kind of person who, upon my very first public address, which he happened to attend, came up to me afterwards and said, son, that was pretty good, but you used the word finally twice. <laughs> and so I'm, I've never felt that I lived up to his standards, although he'd be very happy here today, I think, that all of you were here. Um, I want to thank the, um, the various people in Felice's village who put all of this together as well as the many scholars who, once they found out they weren't really under oath, could write letters on my behalf. Once they found out they weren't under oath, felt they could write letters on my behalf. This is a very hard audience. I can. <laughs> Yeah, eventually, you got it, yeah. I also want to thank the people who've really mattered to me over the years, many of them in this room, particularly my own students and postdocs and many of the mentees and mentirosos over the years. That would be a lot funnier in a Mexican audience, let me just, let me just say. I also am reminded of that great scholar, Bruce Springsteen, who always has a shout out for the people in the cheap seats. And so I want to end by acknowledging all the people who bought individual tickets who are sitting in the back. Thank you all very much. You're my people. Thank you. For the next award, the Distinguished Public Service Award, uh, David Monk will present. Thank you, Mark, and a good afternoon, everyone. The American Educational Research Association's Distinguished Public Service Award is given in recognition of the contributions of those who have worked either to enact or implement policies that are well grounded in education research or who have been at the forefront of efforts to increase recognition and support for the conduct of high quality education research. Dr. Ruby Takanishi is an exceptionally worthy recipient of the 2014 Distinguished Public Service Award from AERA. She has distinguished herself by stimulating, supporting, and encouraging researchers to pursue cutting edge projects from her leadership positions in the Carnegie Corporation, the President's Office of Science and Technology, and most significantly, during her many years as President of the Foundation for Child Development. Dr. Takanishi is an accomplished scholar in her own right. She earned her baccalaureate and PhD degrees from Stanford University and began her career as a faculty member in the UCLA Graduate School of Education. 
In 1998, she received the Distinguished Contributions to Research in Public Policy Award from the American Psychological Association. In 2004, she received the Fred Rogers Leadership Award from Grants Makers for Children, Youth, and Families, an organization representing more than 500 private, corporate, community, and family foundations with a focus on funding youth and family-friendly programs and policies. Her lifelong commitment to the important role research needs to play in the development of sound public policy on children's development is both a fine example of public service and an inspiration for all of us in the field of education. For all of these reasons, it is a special privilege for me on behalf of AERA to present the 2014 Distinguished Public Service Award to Dr. Ruby Takanishi. Congratulations, Dr. Takanishi. Thank you very much. I'm the second, or maybe the third to last, and everybody before me has elevated um, their acceptance remarks to an art form. I, when I s sat down one night after dinner and received this email from AERA, I thought it was a joke. And um, I sort of saw the distinguished part, and I thought, yeah, you know, I'm sort of at that stage. Um, but then I saw the public service part of it, and I, I thought, and then I looked at the other recipients who were all elected officials or individuals who had uh, worked in uh, schools, and um, I said, well, I've never been elected, and I've never um, uh, been a superintendent or whatever. So um, I thought, maybe this is a mistake, but I guess it wasn't. So I would like to, first of all, thank the committee uh, and uh, David Monk for this um, Distinguished Public Service Award. I think what it does, and in the email, recognize early education as an overlooked area in education policy and practice. And since so much of my professional life has aimed at the full inclusion of early education and pre-K education in a transformed pre-K to post-secondary education public education system, this award is especially meaningful to me and also to my colleagues in the early education field. So thank you very much. David and the award committee for the recognition of our efforts. To receive an award, as other people have said, you have to be nominated. And I do know there are many others who are equally or more deserving of this award than I am. And I, without them, the, my, their mentorship, I would not be here today. And I would just like to recognize a few of them and hope that others will be generous in their understanding that I cannot name them all. Giants in our field, David Hamburg, the late Julius Richmond, and Edward Ziegler. Thank you to each one of you for loyal, long, generous mentorship and friendship, which has made this award possible. I would also like to thank the board of directors and the staff of the Foundation for Child Development, many of whom are here today, with whom I worked for 15 years. The long-term commitments that the Board of Directors of the Foundation made to launching what is now called Pre-K to Third are simply extraordinary in the philanthropic sector. But above all, I think the most pivotal influence on my life was my mother. Uh, Misai Tokushige Takanishi was the first in her family to graduate from college at a time when few women of her origins went to college. And her hopes to pursue graduate education were dashed by the outbreak of World War II 
and the restrictions on travel to the continental US for those of Japanese ancestry. But she remained throughout her life a curious individual, always interested in the latest scientific developments and exceedingly well informed, despite the fact she was legally blind for most of her life. And she didn't stop at acquiring knowledge and information. Research was important, but it had to be useful. So when I was walking over here to the convention center, I noticed um, Benjamin Franklin. At least I think it's Benjamin Franklin. Uh, Benjamin Franklin, of course, was one of the founders in the US of the Society for Useful Knowledge. I also was the fortuitous beneficiary of the post-Sputnik preoccupation with catching up with the Soviet Union. So I learned new math and new sciences from teachers who participated in the federally funded in institutes of the National Education Defense Education Act. And combined with my mother's interest in the sciences and these outstanding science and math teachers located as I was in a small rural high school. I knew that whatever I would do in life, research would be part of it. So in my 100-word statement when I applied for college, I wrote that I wanted to be a researcher, and I wanted research to affect the lives of children. In 1965, I took my first course in developmental psychology from my undergraduate advisor, Eleanor Maccabee. Eleanor is now 97 years old, and she remains as intellectually incisive and feisty as she was when I worked with her at Bing Nursery School, a laboratory for research and a school for children. And while Maccabee is a self-described behaviorist, she was then and remains today fiercely committed to the role of government to achieve social justice. To be influenced by such an individual so early in my professional life and by the foundations built by my family in a small sugar plantation town on Kauai are gifts beyond measure. It's really awesome to look at my first paper presented at the AERA convention in New Orleans in 1973. That paper focused on the challenges of connecting research in low-income schools to effective practice. And now, 40 years later, the theme of the 2014 AERA convention is on the power of research to inform education policy and practice. Our current kindergarten to grade 12 education system was socially constructed over 100 years ago to include universal access to high school. By making this award, AERA recognizes that learning really begins way before the outdated starting point of kindergarten, and that today, early education marks the beginning of a redesigned American public education system, pre-kindergarten through lifelong learning. Thank you very much. Now we have a couple of individuals who will receive the Distinguished Contributions to Research and Education Award. Ann Austin will make that presentation. Thank you, Mark. I'd like to begin by acknowledging the other members of the committee, which included Joan Herman, Richard Ingersoll, Henry Levin, Chandra Muller, and Robert Pianta. The AERA Award for Distinguished Contributions to Research and Education is the premier recognition of outstanding achievement and success in education research. The purpose of the award is to publicize, motivate, encourage, and suggest models for education research at its best. In presenting this award, AERA members honor meritorious colleagues who are considered to stand out in the profession by meeting the very highest standards of achievement. This year, the award committee 
made a compelling case to bestow two awards, and we were very delighted that that was approved. I'd like to begin uh, by bestowing the first award to Douglas Fuchs and Lynn Fuchs. Doug and Lynn Fuchs are an extraordinary team of scholars who have devoted their careers to improving the lives of children with disabilities who are at risk for school failure. Through their rigor rigorously conducted and highly cited research, often done in collaboration with teachers and school administrators, they've designed and tested assessment and instructional strategies that increase the school achievement of students with diverse learning needs. The recipients of numerous awards for their research, they're at the inaugural holders of the Nicholas Hobbs Chair in Special Education and Human Development at Vanderbilt, Uni Vanderbilt University, and they've also been named as AERA Fellows. Their work, which is characterized by vision, integrity, and generosity, has impacted research policy and practice, as well as the preparation of many members of the next generation of scholars themselves committed to improving the lives of children. One of their nominators, Deborah Spee, stated, Doug and Lynn have one goal, to improve the lives of children with disabilities or who are at risk for school failure. They carefully and thoughtfully take on the most pressing problems and they find ways to engage a variety of stakeholders in the process. They have an uncanny knack of seeing what's coming and kindly bringing in the rest of us. Recognizing the nature, scope, and impact of their multidimensional work, it's my honor on behalf of AERA to present the 2014 AERA Award for Distinguished Contributions to Research and Education to Professors Doug and Lynn Fuchs. Good afternoon. Um, if Lynn and I had known how many of you there would be, we would have worked a lot harder on this. <laughs> really. Um, we're going to do this in two parts. Uh, I'm going to talk for just a little bit and then Lynn will. Um, in the 1970s, Lynn and I were undergraduates at uh, Johns Hopkins University. Uh, Lynn was majoring in mathematics and I was majoring in psychology. Um, Lynn at the time was living in the Druid Hill section of Baltimore um, in a very much working class neighborhood, uh, many families of color. And um, over time, Lynn and I became uh, very friendly with uh, a bunch of kids in the neighborhood. And one day, Lynn and I decided that we would start a Saturday school for them. And so we used Lynn's apartment as a base, recruited a number of our Hopkins classmates to join us. So we had physics majors coming with simple machines to work on with the kids. And we had chemistry majors and pre-meds coming with various glassware to perform um, hopefully non-lethal uh, uh, reactions, chemical reactions. And um, this Saturday school uh, morphed into a city, Baltimore City supported um, summer school program for these kids and for uh, a bunch of other kids as well. Um, despite the uh, complete failure of the summer program, um, we became increasingly interested in um, trying to figure out systematically what kinds of programs might work for which kinds of kids. Um, and, um, and so um, I think that looking back on it now, what was 
our inspiration uh, over all these years uh, was the realization many, many years ago in Druid Hill that the children that we worked with and befriended um, had so much promise, and yet um, even at that age, their age and our age, we knew that they were facing uh, an uphill struggle. And it touched us, I think, uh, pretty deeply. Um, and so um, I, I think that that's informed our work over the years in trying to develop and validate um, effective academic programs, uh, especially in reading and math, for children at risk, either because of low income or because of disability. Before handing it over to Lynn, I want to share a brief story with you. Um, previous recipients have told, um, I think, wonderful uh, stories. Um, this may sound uh, may be entertaining to you, but I promise you uh, it involved me and it was nothing but, it, it was anything but entertaining. It was my first um, presentation at ARA, 1986-87. At the time, Lynn and I were uh, doing a number of things, including we were pursuing a line of research on non-test factors in the assessment situation that could affect children's test performance. And so we were particularly focusing in on examiner familiarity and the effects of familiarity versus unfamiliarity on the children's test performance. And we had some pretty interesting findings. And so I was there at AERA to share those findings. And I was um, part of a group of five or six people uh, on a raised dais. You know the, you know the scene. And, um, and when it came my turn, um, I was immediately peppered by, and this was, did I say this was Division D? So this was uh, old school test and measurement folks in the audience, about 100 of them. And um, as soon as I began my presentation, I'd be, I was peppered by these uh, increasingly hostile questions. And this was a marked break from the decorum or the, uh, the procedure that I had witnessed up until that point, where everyone was quiet and respectful until the end, and then they asked a few questions, and that was the end of that speaker. I was, uh, I was asked many, many questions, and it was clear, you know, the, uh, the, in the intent of the questions was to poke holes in my suggestion that there were things in the test situation, apart from the test itself, that was contributing to their, to the children's performance. And so when I finally finished, I went back to my seat and uh, to express my dissatisfaction with how I was treated, I, s I sat down very hard in my chair, and the back legs of the chair skidded off the, um, off the dais, and I and my chair were dumped onto the floor. And that's a true story. And um, it kind of gives me pleasure now to tell you this, because it's been a long way since then um, to now. And uh, let me give it to Lynn. Thank you. Hi. I have the official thank you part of this talk. Um, as many of you I know appreciate, uh, research accomplishments uh, are strongly influenced by the efforts of many people and organizations. And we want to thank the agencies that have funded our research, the Office of Special Education Programs in the US Department of Education, uh, the IES National S uh, Center for Research uh, in Special Education, and the National Institute of Child Health and Human Development. We also want to thank Peabody College, and notably our Dean, Camilla Bembo, for providing critical infrastructure and a supportive environment. And we want to thank the administrators, principals, and teachers in the Nashville Public Schools, who beginning with our first studies in the 1980s, and continuing to the present day have been genuine partners in helping us develop programs to address the needs of struggling learners and who have always understood the importance of rigorous testing of those programs with randomized control trials. And we are grateful to AERA for recognizing our work. We want you to know that we feel deeply honored.
I'm also delighted to present the second award for distinguished contributions to research and education. And this award goes to Dr. Adam Gameron. Adam Gameron is a distinguished scholar who produces acclaimed high-impact research and policy work in education and sociology. A member of the National Academy of Education and an inaugural AERA fellow, he has served on the NRC's Board on Science Education and is a presidential appointee to the National Board for Education Sciences of the United States Department of Education. He also is the John D. MacArthur Professor of Sociology and Educational Policy Studies at the University of Wisconsin, where he served as the director of the Wisconsin Center for Education Research. He is currently the president of the W.T. Grant Foundation. A prolific scholar, his research agenda has concerned the organization of schools, ability, group, ability groups, grouping and tracking, standard-based reform, and educational inequality and stratification. Throughout his outstanding career, he's been committed to theoretical engagement, methodological rigor, mentorship and service to the profession, and unwavering efforts to support the educational opportunities and the life chances of disadvantaged youth. Mark Behrens, one of his nominators, wrote, it's difficult to summarize the many accomplishments and contributions that Adam has made to domestic and international research in sociology, education, and educational policy. With the growing awareness of inequalities and lack of social mobility in the United States, Adam Gameron's research, mentorship, and leadership uh, together exemplify a distinguished career addressing these issues. Recognizing the excellence and the impact of his research, I'm honored on behalf of AERA to present the 2014 Award for Distinguished Contributions to Research and Education to Dr. Adam Gameron. Well, that's a tough act to follow, and thanks to so many of you for, for staying so long. What an extraordinary event this has, this has been. I think these should be retitled the Social Justice in Education Awards because so many of the speakers have been recognized for their extraordinary work supporting social justice in education, and I'm very, very proud to be uh, among this list. Thank you to Anne and the committee, to Mark and those who nominated me, to Felice Levine, to Barbara Schneider, and to AERA. I have tried in my research to do two things, to answer sociological puzzles and to respond to pressing problems of education. And over time, I became more and more motivated by po problems of policy and practice, and yet I tried to continue my reliance on discipline-based ideas and tools, even as my questions became more and more, uh, more applied. And now I have an incredible new opportunity to help shape work in education and youth development in an area that I'm passionate about, reducing inequality in youth outcomes and advancing the use of research evidence in decisions that affect young people. And I, I feel so fortunate uh, to be in this position. No one achieves a career of distinction alone, and that is certainly true of me, as I've been aided all the way along by family, by mentors, by colleagues, and by students who have lifted me uh, to the success that I've been able to achieve. My graduate training at the University of Chicago was terrific, particularly from my mentors Robert Dreeben, Charles Bidwell, and James Coleman. When I arrived at Wisconsin, I was fortunate to work in a productive uh, sociology department where my mentors included uh, Robert Mayer, Robert Hauser, Cora Merritt, and uh, someone who was just on her way out but served as a mentor to me and whom we lost this year, Maureen, Maureen Hallinan. Ellen Goldring from Vanderbilt has been a great colleague over the years on many uh, projects. Uh, and subsequently, I had uh, 
wonderful collaborators at Wisconsin, including Marty Nystrand, Jeffrey Borman, and Ruth Lopez Turley. And so thank you to, to all of you. Uh, as my career moved along and I became more and more involved in administration, I found myself relying on my students more and more. Uh, and I've been lucky to have such a fabulous array of students over the years, many of whom are here today. And I'm really honored with your presence, including my first PhD, Mark Behrens, who's done pretty well for himself. Uh, and uh, I have more to come as there are more students still in the pipeline and I'm, I'm lucky that I'll be uh, continuing to, to work with them. And uh, my arrival at the William T. Grant Foundation could not have been warmer. Uh, our Vice President Vivian Tseng has uh, greeted me along with our other staff uh, so well and I'm just greatly looking forward to the opportunity to, to work and to achieve great things with you in the years to come. Finally, uh, I was launched and aided and continue to this day to be supported by an incredible family. My parents, Judith and Hillel Gameron, both educators. Hopefully we'll see this on, on the video. Hi, Mom and Dad. Uh, my siblings, including Miriam Gameron Sharon and my brother-in-law, Bruce Sharon, both noted education professors themselves at Northwestern who are here with me today. Uh, my three children, who are uh, Joel, Daniel, and Naomi, who are the great source of uh, inspiration. And most of all, my partner, my partner in life, my wife, Marla, who has provided love, support, stimulation, and companionship for 32 years. Uh, we've enjoyed our grand new adventure uh, in New York and looking for many, many more years together. Marla, thank you, I love you, and to all of you, thank you. Yes, it's coming to a close. We just have a little bit more to go, so please hang on to your seats. The last thing that we do is the president is allowed to give a special citation to someone who has um, shown exceptional scholarship and service to our field. The first person that I would like to give my presidential citation to is Larry Hedges. Larry Hedges is a renowned statistician and methodologist. He's a board of trustees professor at Northwestern University with appointments in statistics, the Institute for Policy Research, the School of Education and Social Policy, and Psychology. I had to read them all because I didn't want to forget one. But one thing that I think is really important about Larry for those of us who ever knew what a Fisher's and a Spearman row, just think we've got somebody in our midst who's got their own hedges, G. That's quite an accomplishment. Um, I think that is deserving of an applause, please. Um, Larry uh, has really been a dear friend to me. He's a great colleague, and his service to AERA has been wonderful. He was the editor of JEBS, and for those of you who don't know, you can't become the editor of JEBS unless you get the full support of the American Statistical Association, which we publish jointly with them. He served on multiple committees. He has been there. He never says no, and I understand he recently has accepted to join the AERA Grants Board. Thank you, Larry. We really appreciate and need your support. So would you please come forward and receive your citation? It's uh, late in the program, so I'll keep my remarks brief. 
I'd just like to say uh, thank you, Barbara, and uh, thank you to the American Education Research Association. Even though I'm a statistician, uh, the AERA was my first professional organization and has continued to be important to me throughout my career. I owe a lot of what I've been able to accomplish to the support of AERA as an organization and those of you within it. I'd be remiss if I didn't thank my life partner, my wife, Judy Hedges, and I think that with that, I'll just say there are many others who've contributed and they're too numerous to mention. Thank you. I also felt that it was time to recognize Felice Levine the executive director of AERA. Every year people come up here and say, wow, what a, how, this could have never happened without her. She's so wonderful. She does a million things. And all of that is definitely true. Felice does just about everything. As I have said before, she is the pulse of this organization. But we would all be remiss if in fact we just thought that Felice ran the organization. Felice is a scholar. And I think that that oftentimes gets um, undervalued, underestimated, and not seen. And she publishes a lot. She shares an enormous amount of leadership to our field and has had a tremendous presence within the federal policy arena. I am thrilled to be able to give this pres presidential citation to Felice. And finally, 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 <laughs> Um, the last thing that the president is able to do is to give special recognition to the program chair. I knew Mark Behrens as a scholar. We had never collaborated on anything together. I just always admired his work. I knew that he had been fabulous when he was the head of Division L and he had done the most outstanding job putting together the Sociology of Education special program that we have every year at the American Sociological Association. When I saw that program, I said, that's the person that's got to help me. And I called up Mark, who has multiple things going on, and I begged. And he said yes, and it has been really wonderful, a true joy to be able to work with Mark. Mark? You always like short people. I do, I love short people. I'll be very brief. Um, you know, as we heard stories this afternoon about the support that people have behind these plaques, we can't do it without other people. And certainly, I know in my own career, again and again, Barbara has shown up uh, to write letters of support because I've moved around, and she's just been fabulous. And, and this last year has been an absolute joy, so thank you. Uh, I treasure you as a colleague and as a friend, so thank you. I just want to say that my job as program chair it's basically easier than you might think because AERA is huge, and if it weren't for all the divisions and all the SIGs and all of that work, uh, this wouldn't come off. So I, uh, a lot of thanks to all of them to make this program come together. I um, want to thank AERA and the staff, uh, the convention staff that put on the celebration. Um, it's just a fabulous event. And I also, with all the presenters, what's hidden behind that is all of this committee work that goes behind selecting these award winners. And just a lot of thanks to them as well. And finally, um, to the people that won awards, this was incredible to hear these stories this afternoon. It was just lovely. So congratulations to you. I promise that I will tweet all of your work. The pr one problem with that is I have five followers. 
my wife, my daughter, my son's girlfriend, and two people that kind of creep me out because I don't know who they are. <laughs> so, you know, may your work be tweeted well um, and disseminated widely, and congratulations because it's uh, just wonderful to kind of raise you up uh, in our field. So, enjoy the afternoon. This ends the luncheon, the second attempt. We'd love to hear what you thought about it, so please let us know. Thank you all for coming, and I hope to see you at the presidential address at 4.30 next door. Thank you again.